I hope you had a good lunch break, and uh, I welcome you to our, our third session today. We have an excellent panel. I'm going to uh, introduce them in just a moment. Uh, as we get going, though, I was thinking about the uh, discussions earlier on and how it shows the diversity of views one side can have from the other and how many different angles there can be on each, on each issue, on each story. And it, I always, uh, I'm always reminded by a story told to me by the former British Prime Minister, John Major. Um, he, I've heard him tell this story and it, it was very funny. He said that he went to visit uh, the late President Boris Yeltsin at the Kremlin one time and thought he would ask him a tough question. So he said, President Yeltsin, if you could describe the economy of Russia in one word, what would you say? And President Yeltsin said, good. He said, how, how can you say it's good? This is, okay, if you could use more than one word, what would you say? And President Yeltsin said, not good. <laughs> now hopefully we'll get a nice diverse range of views here on this topic. But of course it's a slight, a slight divergence from the Arab Spring and, and our earlier discussion as this session is entitled, Kazakhstan's Anti-Nuclear Initiatives in Light of Iran's Nuclear Program Developments. Um, there's a quote by the famous 20th uh, century British commentator and philosopher, Bertrand Russell. I know it doesn't translate into, into Russian properly, but please forgive me, I'll, I'll say it for those of you who, who can understand it. He said, war does not determine who's right, it determines only who's left. And uh, that should give us some chance to stop and think about the ongoing tensions over claims about Iran's nuclear ambitions. We've once again reached a point where it seems the West and, and perhaps uh, even more Israel are looking to take serious action against uh, Iran, possibly even a major strike is on the cards. Now it's not a new debate, but it one, it's one that continues to uh, present a serious risk to global stability with consequences reaching far beyond uh, Iran and the Arab world. In the middle of that, we have a new anti-nuclear initiative by Kazakhstan, the Atom Project, which was launched by President Nazarbayev at a parliamentary session here in Astana on the 27th of August this year, uh, which was the International Day Against Nuclear Tests. Now, Kazakhstan has already positioned itself uh, as a nation which stands for the renouncement of nuclear weapons and favors the peaceful application of nuclear energy. So it can play, so can it play a role in the global effort to stop nuclear proliferation. And what grounds, real grounds, are there to be concerned about Iran's nuclear program and how justified is the action and response of the West and its allies? Uh, we're bound to have a lively debate uh, with uh, this topic with a panel that features some key uh, figures with inter interesting perspectives on the matter. So allow me to introduce them. To my immediate left, uh, we have Mr. Ramin Memam Parast, who is the spokesman and special assistant at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs for Iran. Next to him, George Galloway, a, a well-known and outspoken member of the British Parliament. We have Ambassador Robert E. Hunter, the former US ambassador to NATO from 1993 to 98. He's a senior advisor at the RAND Corporation. Dr. Armin Sarkisian is the president of Eurasia House International in the UK. Mr. Sergei Dyachenko is Vice Chairman of the Majlis of the Parliament here in Kazakhstan. And Mr. Karib, uh, Karibbek Kuyukov is the is, uh, nuclear, anti-nuclear movement activist with Semi Palantinsk. And I welcome all of you. Thank you very much. We're going to try to get this as a debate uh, featuring your questions and comments as soon as possible. So I'm just going to kick off with a, a couple of questions to each person, but I really want to make sure that you can take part in this with your contribution. So I'm going to start first with uh, Mr. Ramin uh, Memon Parast and, and ask about the reaction, uh, if I could have a sort of a brief reaction from you to the way uh, much of the world seems to be reacting to Iran's nuclear program right now and, and this threat potential uh, of a potential strike as well. What, what do you feel is the main concern from the Iranian side? حقوقی که در معاهده ام پی تی برای ما تعریف شده. بنابراین ضمن اینکه ما خودمون رو عضو سازمان بیسیکلی 
or Iran. Iran is uh, the IE member, and we signed the respective treaties. We oppose uh, the whole idea of creating nuclear weapons, and our spiritual leader uh, called the use and creation of nuclear weapons haram, or something which is not allowed, or something that is completely prohibited, and this is stronger than any political will. So basically, we created we created the movement against uh, nuclear weapons uh, in the whole world. And we believe that in the uh, IA Treaty, there are three important uh, rules or terms that we sh everyone has to follow. First of all, the, uh, the extermination of nuclear weapons, destruction of nuclear weapons, non-proliferation, and that all of the countries should use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes only because we act based on our rights, we believe that so far we haven't violated any laws or international conventions. And the reaction that we are seeing at the moment, we don't believe this is an international reaction. We believe that some of the countries simply believe that our nuclear program, basically they don't believe that this is somewhat contradictory to their interests. Basically, these are the countries who do possess nuclear arms, especially the United States of America as one of these countries. They are producing a lot of pressure in the non-proliferation program. This is the only country that used nuclear weapons. And because of the disuse, no, hundreds of Dozens of thousands of people died in the U.S., and should it be necessary, the U.S. would not hesitate to use this weapon again. So this is not the global community that is having some negative opinion about our nuclear program, but although this is just a bunch of countries you know, to which our nuclear program seems to be in the contradiction with their interests. We believe that for the major majority of the global community, for the majority of the UN. United Nations member countries, basically most of them supported our nuclear program, and we perform our activities within the framework of the countries that support us. And we really would like to start negotiations uh, according to the arrangement 5 plus, plus 1, and we also would like to basically to comfort any of the concerns that exist out there in the world, just to continue to use our right to peacefully use nuclear energy. But, but let me bring in George Galloway, who uh, was well known for um, not taking necessarily the, the consensus that, uh, you know, some people are forced to when it comes to uh, being in a, in a government position. But I remember, Mr. Galloway, you, you said a while back, if I was Iran, I'd get nuclear weapons. Yes. You still believe that? I do. To be lectured on the question of nuclear weapons by Israel and the United States, and Britain for that matter, it's a bit like being told to sit up straight by the hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> These countries, which, have, which are bristling with thousands of nuclear weapons, in the case of Israel, hundreds of them pointed at Iran. And we know that, thanks to the brave Jewish whistleblower Mordechai Vonunu, who spent 20 years in solitary confinement, his jaws wired together so he couldn't tell us any more when he had to appear in court. So there is no question that the one country in the Middle East which has hundreds of nuclear weapons, never mind one, is Israel. And it is threatening Iran, which has no nuclear weapons and which is forbidden to develop nuclear weapons by virtue of the religio-political line of the Imam Ayatollah Khomeini. So there's something Kafka-esque about this. And uh, I think, I don't want to shoot the fox before we've started, but it's a non-issue. Israel has hundreds of nuclear weapons. Iran has no nuclear weapons. Israel is not sanctioned, but rewarded. Iran is sanctioned and threatened. And this double standard is so brazen that outside of the paradigm of the Western media, 
everyone can see that. But inside the bubble of Western policymakers and the Western media, this is treated uh, seriously. You and I, Riz, have some history in the sense that we've both been here before. This was the road that led to the destruction of Iraq, the death of a million people, the displacement of three millions of people, the canard that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. When not only did it not, it would not have been invaded if it had. I just add this. If Israel, as you predict, perhaps just for argument's sake, attacks Iran, and if America attacks Iran, and it's the same thing, it will be the biggest mistake in history. And we'll come on, I hope, to adumbrate just exactly the dreadful consequences that that will have. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. Let me uh, get to Ambassador Robert Hunter then. And we will develop this argument because there are a number of sides to this. There's the political side, and then there's the, the anti-nuclear initiative, which I'll get onto a little bit later. But Ambassador uh, Robert Hunter, if I could ask you, sir, listening to Mr. Meman Paras saying it's been declared haram in Iran, that there is no will to have nuclear weapons, hearing George Galloway say that either way, um, it's, there are other countries with nuclear weapons and there's a hypocrisy here. Let me ask you, as someone who's served at the top levels in the United States government, uh, particularly in, in issues of national security, is it fair to say there's a particular mindset in the USA towards, uh, towards Iran, uh, perhaps especially in the government and intelligence communities, that doesn't really leave any room or any window for compromise or negotiation? I mean, have we gone so far that Iran could never be reprieved in the U.S.'s eyes? Well, first, uh, I did serve in the U.S. government, but I don't now. Mm -hmm. So I'll speak for me and yes, not sir. for the U.S. government. I hope everybody understands that. But I appreciate the way that you phrased the question. Uh, so we don't engage in a dialogue of the deaf with our Iranian friend stating his position and me stating an American position, and we just go off and get nowhere. But rather the question of how do we get beyond what, it, what is a current standoff at the moment. Uh, we've had a lot of bad blood between Iran and the United States. Uh, maybe in part because in the past we had a much closer kind of relationship than we have now. Uh, the Iranians, I am told, will all remember what happened with Mr. Mossadegh in 1953. He got overthrown by the British and the Americans. Uh, some people will say that, well, if Mossadegh had stayed around, maybe the Iranians wouldn't have liked it so much, but anyway, that's history. Uh, I worked in the White House in charge of Middle East affairs through the 444 days of the, of the hostage crisis, so I know how we in the United States uh, 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 feel about it. But I think we need to go beyond uh, where we were in the past. Uh, uh, a friend of mine once said, what we really need to have is International Apology Day, in which everybody will apologize for every sin ever done by everybody to everybody else, and then let's get on with the future. Because I think right now is what we need, is we need to have a capacity for Iran and the United States to talk directly with one another. Not with P5 plus one or, or whatever it is, but getting down together and talking about various things. One thing, would be to help the Iranians understand that having nuclear weapons can be a white elephant. It's not necessarily a good thing, that if you look at the problems of nuclear strategy, uh, I'm not so sure I would want to get nuclear weapons or have them, like the South Africans decided to give up theirs. Uh, secondly, I think it's important for Americans to understand uh, that uh, the Iranians are not uh, 15 feet tall, that are fire breathers, that are trying to destroy all their neighborhood, to understand, for example, that uh, Iran hasn't attacked anybody for a long time. They did in the past, they went as far as Egypt, uh, but they haven't attacked anybody for a long time. To get down and start talking to one another about the realities of the situation and see uh, where we might have some common interests. For example, uh, in 2001, when the United States was attacked out of the clear blue sky on 9-11, and we went into uh, Afghanistan. The Iranians supported us. The Iranians supported us all the way up through the Bonn Conference uh, 
the following year. Uh, we and the Iranians may have a common interest in regard to certain things in Iraq. We certainly all have a common interest in the free flow of commerce through the Strait of, uh, of Tehran, of counter piracy, a lot of other things. But we don't talk about these things. We talk about this one issue. And I think by talking about that one issue, we're going to just continue to go round and round in circles and get nowhere. So by all means, let's talk about it. But let's get on to the other business as well. And uh, let's get out of the way some of the other countries around who don't want to see a reconciliation between the United States and Iran. There are a number of countries like that. I love your idea of the International Apology Day, Ambassador. I wonder if it would work for husbands and wives. <laughs> uh, I've been married for 32 years, and once we get the Iran-American relationship sorted out, maybe we can work on marriages. <laughs> so thank you. I'll get back to you in, in just a moment. I'll bring in Dr. Armin Sarkissian here and, and ask about one initiative that's just been taken that I'd mentioned, sir, in the, uh, in the opening introduction, the Atom Project that President Nazarbayev has initiated here in, in Kazakhstan, the idea of uh, abolishing testing, nuclear testing, and the consequences of it. And I wonder what impact you feel such an initiative can have, and can it play a part in the current affairs of nuclear politics as we're hearing them? I think you are right that uh, the initiative that comes uh, from the President of Kazakhstan has great value because it's, it's an initiative from a country that has a history of doing so. When the Soviet Union broke down, this country was one of the former Soviet republics that had a nuclear basis and nuclear arms here. But voluntarily, the president and the country gave it up, returned it back to Russia, and became a completely uh, nuclear, uh, uh, neutral country. But Kazakhstan, uh, so this initiative is very important, and I hope that it will get support not only on, in the framework of the International Atomic Agency, but much more wider worldwide. But there's much more than this. I think uh, Kazakhstan is a wonderful example, and I'm just taking you away from the Iran-America dialogue or dispute, whatever you call it, and about uh, the, the issue of Iranian um, and nuclear uh, ambitions a bit further. Let's look at it more globally. I think, I think it's very important to look at Kazakhstan as a much wider case. This country, not only uh, more than around 20 years ago, gave up their nuclear military ambitions, but being a country which is very rich in hydrocarbons, decided and had a vision, the president, the government, and the country to develop itself as a nuclear state, but completely, uh, completely non-military aspects of that. And as a result of that, uh, this country has become the biggest producer of, uh, of uranium in the world. Kazakhstan produces around, if I'm not mistaken, and I think I'll be very careful with the figures because we have here uh, Mr. Shkolnik, who is heading the uh, Kazatom Prom, and he'll be the, the expert to answer these uh, sort of questions. The country is producing around 20,000 tons, and it is, this is one third, one third of all produced uranium in the world. Except that just recently, around two years ago, the president of uh, uh, Kazakhstan, Mr. Nazarbayev, supported and came up with the further ideas of initiative to create International Bank of Nuclear Fuel in the framework of the International Atomic Agency, showing, first of all, the readiness of putting the nuclear fuel under the control of the international community. Whoever has an ambition to have nuclear energy, they will, should come to the international organization and borrow or buy it through the agent or a company that will produce that and so on and so forth. I think the key factor here is the country like Kazakhstan, because of its nuclear good nuclear history has the right of being a leader and showing because people have respect towards nuclear policies of this country and I think they can be a leader in peaceful nuclear technologies worldwide. Thank you, Dr. Sarkisian. And, and that leads me directly on to the Vice Chairman of the Majlis of the Parliament of Kazakhstan, Mr. Sergei Diachenko. And listening to what uh, Dr. Sarkisian had to say there, how can 
Kazakhstan get the world to listen then? How can it actually have some kind of influence uh, beyond just what is happening here? How can it really make a difference in changing nuclear politics in the world then? Thank you. Following up on what Mr. Sarkisyan said, I would like to say that I share your view. Indeed, Kazakhstan's leadership in the area of nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament is a non-best fact for all of the world. Thank you very much for your high evaluation. Speaking about the first question, Mr. Moderator, indeed, there is a problem. Uh, about the nuclear problem of Iran. This is a problem and it's an issue that bothers all of the world. Naturally, Kazakhstan's policy is about diplomatic solutions, finding diplomatic solutions. I would like to remind you that in Seoul this year, our leader of our nation, President Nazarbayev, when he talked about the nuclear energy, following up on your first question, should be developed only when the guarantees are provided for security on the basis of universality, operate, quick response, and finally, equality and trust. All nations should, have be, should be granted the equal access to nuclear technologies. We also have with us a very special guest, uh, Mr. Karipek uh, Kuyukov, who actually can illustrate for us um, what the dangers are when nuclear testing is done. And I think you can tell us your, your story, uh, Mr. Kuyukov. What, tell us basically your, your life story and in, in how it's affected you and why you got into the anti-nuclear movement. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I was born in Yigindabulak village, which is 90 kilometers from the former Simpalatinsk nuclear polygon. My parents were witnesses to testing. Currently, I'm an ambassador to ATOM anti-nuclear project. I'm not the only one like this. If you go to the website of this project, Adam, you will see very many similar children who are victims.